everyone can have a great class. Thanks, Felicia. Hi, everybody. Happy Friday. It's getting the buttons here. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, today's class was a fun one. I see lots of happy faces. Thanks, guys. <laughs> um, I always enjoy our Fridays together. So happy to see you. Um, so today's class is the um, really cool version of stitching on a bead. And we've done some stitching on beads before. Um, there's a class that uh, is in the handout that I highlighted that is a review of brick stitching on a component, which I felt was the most similar in steps and shape to what we're doing today. But we also have another class that I didn't include here that I just thought of, which was the, um, there was one where we beat on a bead sun earrings. And I think it was more than a year ago that we taught that, but it's a very similar technique where you're using a bead as your base, like as your component to stitch on. And the cool thing about that is we all have a lot of beads. And we um, sometimes maybe don't have an idea other than stringing them for something to do with those beads. So um, this is just another way to stretch your stash. And if you're um, interested in making a gemstone element with your stitch designs, it's another way to bring in a gemstone. So I found when I was at Michael's, what I've got here on the mat are all the materials. And I was really drawn to these turquoise discs. And so I was going to talk a little bit about selecting a bead for this type of technique. So the, the very first step you, you do is you, you use it as literally just a, a component. There's really no difference in, in the type of brick stitch that we're doing here, other than you're going to see a lot more of your thread because it's going to cover your, it's going to cover your bead. And so disc spacers are ideal for this kind of thing. And a coin bead would also work, um, but it would be a different kind of setup, like where you'd be stitching around this way versus this way. This is the easiest way to do it. But when, you, when you're when you selecting your bead, look for one that has like um, kind of a flat edge. So something for the bead to sit on the side of. It doesn't have to be completely flat. It can be a little bit, you know, rounded. But as long as it's got something where the, it will encourage the beads to stay in a ring. Um, and so ideally these um, spacers, which are 10 millimeter, and they come in others other than this halide. This was the turquoise I thought looked so great with like a silver, um, but you can bring in, I think I saw amethyst. I think I saw uh, like a, roto, a rhodochrosite. It was like a pink stone. Um, I saw a few others that uh, maybe like a jasper. So take a look at what's on the wall there. And uh, of course, take a look at what's in your stash. The 10 millimeter is not a requirement. And when we get started stitching, I was going to explain why this stitch will work no matter how many beads around you end up adding and that it'll vary. It'll vary even among just these beads. So the same strand, same size, you might get one or two off between the two. It doesn't stand out, it doesn't show, but um, it's one of those things that you, there's no set count, right? So you're gonna just kind of feel it out and see as you get around the bead how many it needs. And no matter how many it needs, it's all adjustable and you can make it work. And so for the, the beads, I decided just to stick it with one color, one size, keeping it simple. These are the three pack beads that we were using last week. And last week we were using these two colors. So this week we're gonna use the uh, other one that's in there, which is more of a shiny silver instead of a matte. It's got just a little bit of a different look. And then I brought in at the end um, to create kind of like an ear wire junction. I created some, like a crystal transition with the seed beads and then just went directly to the ear wire. So it's a really seamless look and it's super light too. Really pretty, easy, simple design. Um, so there's all those. So for thread needles, you have a choice um, and I'll show you the difference. I used gold. Um, today I'm gonna teach with black so you can see what I'm doing, but I did use the gold color because I thought that looked neat. I was doing like a mixed metal finish. This is Nymo, the gold Nymo. It's on the sample. Here's beige wildfire. And here's what that looks like. So really almost indistinguishable. I'll put them side by side. Not standing out, but you might have a little bit easier time if this is new for you to work with the wildfire because it's stabilizing. So thinking about that, like which one do you like? Which one do you think will work? What thread do you like working with? Um, and if you're a beginner, I think maybe start with the wildfire and then move into the Nymo from there. But either is going to work great. And I'm using a size 12 beading needle, especially important if you're going to work with the wildfire. You want to be working with the 12. And yeah, so that's pretty much it. So um, I'm going to dive in. You want to cut 60 inches of whichever thread you're using. And of course, um, 
any questions, just pop them in the chat. And for any new people, this is one of those classes where I am going to work in um, kind of like steps because completing one of these earrings takes about 45 minutes from start to finish. So I have jump ahead samples that are ready to show people. Um, and especially since I've got both of these at points in the design where you might want to see it twice. So I'll try to get there with the one I'm starting and then I'll also have the ch a chance to show you twice with, with these. But each of these is at, at a stopping point where we do, you, you switch it to do something different. So let's see, I'm gonna set those aside and remind everybody about the PDF that it has all the steps in it so you don't have to memorize anything I'm showing. There, and of course, um, Felicia mentioned there's gonna be a recording so you can go back and rewatch that for anything that you get stuck on or maybe wanted to see again. But step one is super easy. We're gonna cut 60 inches of thread. We're gonna tie a knot um, onto, the, onto the disc bead and then start brick stitching around. And so as we go, it's gonna share some tips um, for brick stitching in general and just everything, everything beading here. So again, about 60 inches, I wanna trim that. For me, that's a wingspan, so I never really have to measure. I just stretch my arms out and I get about 60 inches that way. And so to thread your needle, get some chain those pliers and then just flatten the end of your, of your thread. You'll get a little almost paper thin. And here's my beading needle. Let me get that on there. Okay. And then just fold down maybe like seven inches or so. Just uh, it's worked on a single strand. And we're gonna leave a seven inch tail to start. So here's one of my spacer beads. And I'm gonna go ahead and bring the needle through the center. Let's go through here it down and the tail that we're going to leave here about seven to ten inches its only purpose will be to weave up into the design um, just to get it out of the way but because we're knotting you don't need to worry you know so much about how we're going to weave it in so the length isn't as important as it is on some of the other designs we do just enough that you can get a needle on it and get it in through a few beads and trim it and so there's uh, my first knot. So it's like we're tying our shoes. Just one knot there. And I'm going to make it a double knot by doing that one more time. Let's bring that through. And if you can, it might just happen for you automatically, but try to get your knot to sit on the side of your bead. So there's my knot. And if yours is not sitting, uh, a good way to get it to do that is take both the tail and the working side and just pull it. And that'll make it stay on the side. So that's step one. And then let's get some seed beads. Again, these are size 10 check. And they're from the palette that we used last week. And their uh, part number is in the handout. If you didn't find the palette or you just want to get the single color, this um, silver color is also available as just a standalone tube on the Michaels wall. It's called metallic silver and it's in size 10 check. Okay, so I like to start my brick stitch a little bit different. I, I know a lot of folks will bring on two beads and then they'll start stitching, but I bring on one first. And then I bring my tail up through that bead. And that helps with um, getting it to sit straight. You know, and also with hiding your knot. And there will be one point where we're gonna have to kind of maneuver around this knot, but it's, it's totally doable. But so there I pulled the working and tail thread apart and um, I got the bead to sit right on the side. And so this is where, when I was mentioning wildfire is really stabilizing, this is where it really shines. It's performing really nicely here. If you're using the Nymo, it's gonna wiggle more still going to work out just fine, but it's going to move a little bit more on you. And sometimes you might feel like you need to go back through it, um, which you can, you can always do. Let me get my keyboard tray out of the way. Sorry, guys. My throat always sucks to it. Okay. So now I'm going to pick up one more bead. And I'm going to go through the center of this bead. Just like that. And go ahead and pull all the way through. And what'll kind of happen is the bead will just sit. It'll just sit like that, a little bit loosely until you go back through it. And you wanna go back through it 
in the direction that your thread is, is coming out. So in that direction, right? We went through here, we're gonna go back up through it from below. I, I, I call it below, but it's basically because that's, to me, it's sitting on the side of the component and we're coming up under it. And so when you pull tight, you'll get a really cool side-by-side -side sit for those two beads. And that's the whole step one. I'm just gonna go all the way around. So let's put a few more beads on there and check in with everybody. This is basic brick stitch. So a lot of you guys have seen this before. And the only real difference here is just the kind of awkwardness of working on disc bead versus a component. <laughs> hey guys, I'm seeing lots of cool comments in the chat. And so here's just how fast it goes. It's easy to get started. It's easy to get going. You can make one of these very, um, you know, very efficiently. Once you've made a few, you'll get faster. Like the first one probably took me 40 minutes or so. In teaching and demoing, probably take about that long. But sitting, working at speed, maybe I could get one done in like maybe 30 minutes even or less, depending on how big the component is, how big the bead is. But that's it so far. Does anybody need to see starting it again or should I keep going around? Drop that in the chat. I'll keep stitching them while we uh, while we figure that out. <laughs> you guys are talking about coffee in the chat. Yeah, because I I have um well I just had my birthday and I was given an espresso maker for Chris for my birthday slash early Christmas. <laughs> And I'm really excited about my espresso maker. And I saw someone say, keep going. And I see a start again. So we will do both. We'll do both. Um, let me take this all the way around so you guys can see how easy and fast. And then I'll just start one again. And then we'll, uh, we'll join them. But all I'm doing right here is a very, a very fun, just stitch on a component brick stitch step here. So there's like a little, good little half moon. So you can kind of see where the design possibility here of all the stuff you can do. Let me set this one aside really quick and just start over one more time. I saw at least one, one request for seeing a start over. And so um, to recap from the handout, it's 60 inches and that's um, that's plenty. It gives you a little extra. Uh, for weaving in and all of the other little things that you might need it for. And so I'm using wildfire, but you can also use Nymo. And flattening the edge here, size 12 beading needle. Pull that over. Okay. And again, these are 10 millimeter disc spacers. And I found these on the wall at the, at the semi-precious wall. So they are uh, how light, I'm calling them turquoise, but they they have that beautiful look of a southwestern next to silver, which is kind of what I was going for. And you want to bring the bead onto the needle and bring it to the end, leave about a seven inch tail, and then tie a double knot, just like you're tying your shoelaces, just tie a double knot. Here's one. Try to get your knot to sit on the side of your bead if you can. And if it's not cooperating, I'll show another trick here in a second. Just go ahead and tie a double knot. To, and if, if so, mine's all already on the side. I feel like I can keep going. But if you're having any trouble getting it to sit on the side, you can pull the working and tail threads together, and it'll bring that knot to you know I can move it around a little bit there. Pick up one bead, and this is a uh, kind of an unusual brick start, but it's one that I like. So you bring on one, and take the tail thread and just feed it up through the bead. And these are size 10 check, sorry if I didn't mention earlier. And then see how I'm pulling the working and the tail threads apart. And that just puts 
everything where you want it. It puts the knot inside the bead. It puts the bead on the side and it's super stabilizing. So that trick is particularly helpful if you're working with the Nyma. With the wildfire, it's kind of making everything just do everything very smoothly automatically. The, you will kind of have to finesse it just a little more if you're working with the other thread. They will both work. So um, pick up one more bead and bring it through and then pull tight. And so what I'm doing right now is I'm actually pinching the bead with my fingers and that's just forcing this bead to sit side by side. But the thread there is coming out through the back, going through the bead. I'm gonna bring this thread over the front here and up through that bead. And then when you pull tight, you'll get a side-by-side -side position of the beads. So from there, you just do the same thing again. You'll wanna pick up another bead, go through the center, pull tight. And again, I'm kind of using my finger back here to help me, keeping the bead on the side and then tighten. There's one more. pull tight. And so with the beads that, you know, if you're not using the exact beads I am, that is totally okay. So this is going to work on most beads. A lot of the ones that you're, um, you'll try, if you can, if you can kind of try to select ones that have a side, it is helpful, but not required. This would still work. For example, if this was a round bead and it had a hole kind of facing in the center like that, like maybe more like a donut, you would just have to really help it. And to help it, you would just need to pinch both sides. Once the, um, once the seed beads start to form a ring, they hold themselves on the bead, you know, just by their own structure, um, especially if you're working with the wildfire, but I should keep going. Even if I had this as like a more rounded edge, it would still probably work. You just have to really help it. But I, I just think for the first time trying it, if you can try to select a bead that that does have more of this shape, but the diameter, it doesn't matter at all. Like any diameter will work. These are 10 millimeter, but you can do 12, you can do eight, you can do any, any will work. So I switched ahead. Um, this is the one that we we're just working on. And I just jumping back to the one that I had a little further along. And so you'll want to go ahead and keep going. And I purposely didn't share the counts because I wanted everyone to feel free to get the counts right for their bead. And even if, I, like I was saying, if you're using the same exact beads, you still might get a different one off from the other, even among just the same pair of earrings. And that kind of variation is totally normal because it's a natural bead and it um, just might have a slightly different shape, slightly different. And then there's variation in the seed beads themselves. It's going to matter whether or not you're using wildfire or NIMO. That might change the count. But the steps should all still work. And I'm going to show you what I mean by kind of just feeling it out. And that's something that comes with experience, just with time. And as you're learning, a lot of, like when I was beginning to do a lot of brick stitch, I started to get more and more picky as I went, but I would pull my work out sometimes. Like I would create it, look at it, feel like it was too bunchy or had too many gaps and vice versa. And then I would just go ahead and pull the, pull the work back out and change the count up until I felt good about it. And so that's absolutely what we have to do here for the same exact, you know, thought process. So, and I'm getting there right now to where I have to decide if I need another bead or not. So almost to the point where they're gonna meet, right? And this is that kind of debate. It's like, could I fit one more bead? And you'd be surprised. So sometimes uh, a, a large gap becomes a lot smaller when you join. And sometimes it's just not enough. You need to add a bead. Also, you can slide these. So for example, if you feel like you need to adjust them, there is the possibility to slide these around. And so let me see what happens if I try to add one more. 
And if it doesn't look right, I will pull it out. And having too many beads will cause the um, ring around it not to be straight. It will kind of bunch a little bit. So let's see how this looks. Maybe it might be working. Let's see. So this is how you join it. And if after we join it, we might pull it out. We'll just have to decide. But um, this is the starter bead. This is the very first bead that we tied the knot, brought the tail up through. This is the last one we just added. I'm going to come down through that first bead. And remember, there's a knot in there. So just gently maneuver around it. One way to get around a knot in a bead is to push on the side of the bead. And it'll kind of help you weave around it. And as I'm coming down here, I'm just going to try to avoid capturing my tail twice. OK, so here's the join. So far, all I've done is go down through that bead. And what do we think? It doesn't have too much wander. And by wander, wander looks like this. See, like if it does this, and then the next one's doing that. Um, but this one, I feel like it's OK. So all the beads are all traveling kind of in the same direction. But if you didn't like it, you could pull it out and you could have one less bead on there. All right, so from here, we went down through this bead, just through the, the one that our tail is coming out. Now go ahead and go through the center. So go through the center of your disc and try to line your thread up over the one below it, if you can. And this one's going to show a lot. Um, and then come back up through that same bead. That is the one the tail's sticking out of. And that's the one we just went down. And when you do that, you'll get a really tight join. And again, you can pull working a tail thread apart to tighten things up. And so this is what I would consider like the maximum tight fit. I wouldn't let it get any tighter than that. If it was any tighter than that, I would pull that bead out and join with one less bead. Danielle? So, yeah. Now I have, I'm going to ask you two quick questions. Sure. Number one, with brick stitch, it's one bead at a time for this um, project? For this project, it is, yeah. Definitely. And um, oh, the second question is, do we need to keep track that it's an even number of beads or an odd number of beads? No, it's totally okay, because at the end, there's a way to make up for it, depending on how much space you have when you add to your wire. Okay, thank you. And you'll find it's different even between just two beads. So uh, I could sh show the join again. I have this other one over here. It was done with the other color of thread. So you can see a little different look here was achieved. Uh, and I'm gonna grab a needle. There's one right here. But here's one that I have to make that same call. Like, how much space do I have? Does it? So let's get the needle on this one. And I feel like this one is more of a sure, like a sure, like we do definitely need another bead, but let's see. So I picked up a bead. And I'm going through the center, pull tight, using my finger at the back side of the bead to kind of keep the uh, seed bead on the top, and then tighten that down, and then taking a look to see. And if, yeah, it's another tight fit, but it's going to work. So there we go. And then if you have any of this going on where you you don't feel like it's lining up properly, you can adjust it now. See, that was the thread I just strung. So I just cleaned that up a little bit. And since seeing the thread is kind of a feature of the design, you might you might want to do that. Just kind of move it around. All right, so here comes another join. This is the tail thread here. This is the working thread. And I'm going to bring it down through the bead that my tail is exiting from. 
you're remembering that there's a knot in there. So you might struggle a little bit, but just wiggle your needle, press against the side of the bead, get around that knot. And then coming down. And that looks, it's gonna work. It's gonna, it's looking a little bit wonky right now, but see, there's a little tilt in that direction, but I think I can fix that. So go through the bead. Through the center of the disc there. I'm gonna try to line up my thread over the one that it's covering. I'm gonna flip it over and come up through that bead. And again, that's the one our tail's exiting. It's the one we just went down and pull tight. And that fixed the kind of wonkiness. You can also pull working a tail thread apart. Take a look at it, make sure you like it. It's not too late to change it if you don't, but that's looking okay to me. And so I would keep that as it is and keep going. Okay, so let's switch back to the color we can see a little easier. That is this one right here. And what we wanna do now is the same thing we've been doing, except for we're gonna add um, another layer. And how that looks on here is we're gonna start to put beads all the way around. And this is where the counts really might change, but don't worry too much about it. And at the beginning of this, we're gonna, we're gonna start with two beads here. Um, and I'll explain why. So in brick stitch, um, when we first attached our bead here, we brought our tail thread up through the first bead. So we were able to hide the thread, but if we tried to do that again and went under the first thread bridge, what would happen is you would see the thread on that side. And maybe that's okay, but I like to, at least in this kind of design, start with two beads. So that thread is now gonna be hidden. So we've got two beads here. We're gonna skip the first thread bridge and go under the second. And what a thread bridge is, is we just created those when we added our bead, but it's the traveling of the thread from outside of one seed bead into the next one. So you're going under, under that little spot right there, under the thread there. So I'm gonna count two from where my exiting thread is. Here's one and here's two because I've got two beads and then pull tight. The beads will kind of sit there side by side. They're gonna look a little funny for now. And bring your needle up through the second one. And that bead will sit pretty nicely. This one over here, you can keep going around and worry about it later, or if you want to, you can go ahead and bring the tail up through it. And that can help you make it sit a little bit straighter. But what's really gonna lock it down is when we, when we make our trip all the way around, we're gonna go back down through that bead and it'll be flattened when we do that. So for now, I'm just gonna let it be as it is and not worry too much about it. So pick up another bead and go under the next thread bridge. And this is one of those things where, um, again, you're gonna need to feel it out a little bit. So take a look at where your bead is sitting and where's the nearest next point you can go under. In this case, it's the next thread bridge for me. But that may not always be the case because the um, number of beads that we go around isn't gonna be one for one. There's gonna be extra because it's a larger trip around than it was on the first trip. So you're gonna have a greater circumference to cover. So you may need to double at least once or twice. You may need to put two beads in one thread bridge. And how that usually works out for me is I divide it into a clock or maybe even you could say a compass, like a north, south, west, and east. And I've noticed that every corner, or sorry, every fourth, I have a place where it feels right to put two seed beads in one thread bridge once a quarter around. So, and, and where that's really gonna be up to you just based on when you're looking at it, what does it look like to me? You'll know when it isn't right because it'll do that bunching thing where if you look at it from this angle, one bead might be over here and the other bead will be kind of over here. It'll do this little like zigzag thing. The zigzag is when you've got too many, too many beads. And of course gaps means you've got too few. So let's see how this looks. I'm gonna keep going around. And now I'm into the next quadrant and 
take a look at this one. We've got a lot of space here. I could double up here. And if I don't do it here, I'll definitely end up doing because see, see how big, big of a jump that is? Is it bigger than a bead? And one way to tell is just bring your bead down and look at it. So this one could go either way. I could put it under the first thread bridge or I could you know, share the one that I'm exiting, right? Um, or go into the next and let's see what happens when you go under the next. It might work and it might look a little bit stretched out. So it, you see how it kind of bent it this way? It's okay, it's gonna straighten out when I put the next bead on, but anything wider than that, and I am gonna share that, that little bridge it's covering slightly, I'm gonna go into that one. Um, now it's gonna flatten. But give yourself grace with this step because it's not gonna be perfect, especially if you're trying it the first time. And you're gonna have to just pull a bead out if you don't like it, maybe put, um, put an extra one on or take one out. But after after a while, what you develop is this like kind of sixth sense or what the bead is going to do, depending on what bridge you choose. And you'll see it in your mind before you've done the stitch. So, so far, so good. Everything's just staying where I put it. But here, I'm going to share the thread bridge of that one. And I'm just doing that by instinct. And see, that was just the, the perfect placement for it. Oh, thanks, Wanda. Yeah, this is a really pretty stitch, and especially on the turquoise. But one of the reasons I really like the um, the other thread, even though it's a little harder to work with, is the colors. There's a lot more colors that you can choose from. And so I like to kind of have it, uh, an option to play with that. Like, wouldn't it be beautiful to have like some burgundy thread on like a green gemstone for, for holidays? That would be gorgeous. Okay, here's another decision point. And then here I am in the fourth quadrant again. Um, hmm. And I hope that makes sense to everybody that it's just, it's not always gonna be the next thread bridge. Sometimes you're gonna double up. And that, yeah, that's looking right. Okay, so I shared a thread bridge with this, this bead with the last one. And now let's see if I can make it all the way over to the end in just a one for one. Hmm. I went through the wrong direction on that. There it goes. It's easy to do. Okay, here's the next one. It's working so far. Everything's going well. And we're getting close to joining it. Here's where we're at so far. Obviously, we need one more bead, but do we need two? How many thread bridges do I have left? I've used this one and it's pretty well covered. I have one more and this one is covering the one after it. So I think this is my last bead and I'll show you why. So go ahead and pull tight, come up through it, tighten down. And you see how this bead over here is sitting kind of sideways. When it comes back down flat, we're gonna be not having enough space for another bead. The gap's a little wider than I want it to be. So I'm gonna make it work. Come down through this bead. And for this join, I'm gonna use another trick. Now remember on the last one, we went through the center of the bead. For this one, we're gonna choose a thread bridge instead of going through the bead, right? Because we don't wanna go through the bead, we'd cover up the, we'd cover up that first row. So we're gonna borrow, I'm gonna borrow the thread bridge that's over here. So it's a little further away from my bead, right? See, I'm coming down through this one and I'm jumping over here, but what it's gonna do is it's gonna close up that gap and it's gonna make the join look seamless. 
So I'm going to come up through the one that my tail is coming out of and tighten it. Take a look, make sure I like it. So it's not perfect. It has a gap and I don't like that gap, but that gap's not big enough for another bead. So I'm going to do something else. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring this bead a little bit closer to that bead. Easy to do. Come down through, and this step's only needed if you feel like you want to. It's totally optional here, but I'm going to come down through that bead. Try to make it so you guys can see, sorry. <laughs> um, tighten that up. Using some pretty good tension here. And then just to get under the thread bridge when you can't see it, one of the easiest ways to do that is just go in between the beads below it. So for that, I want to go through here. Get that tail to stay out of the way there. Okay, that's looking so much better. And then I'm going to come up through that same bead. Okay, what do you think? It seems a little bit, a little tighter, a little cleaner looking. And again, I'm not worrying about the counts. Notice I didn't count any of these beads. I just started putting them on there and just feeling it out, seeing where they go. Because it could be, it could end up being different. So how does everyone feel about that, jo that join? Danielle, I can, I, I can speak for everybody saying that was an amazing tip. It looks amazing. No, I, th I think if you hadn't demonstrated that today, I never would have understood that. And I probably would have hated the gap and stopped my project. So just you showing us a fix to make it look even more perfect is brilliant. Oh, great. Yeah, I'm hoping that helps somebody when they're in the middle of their project. But Yeah, I want you to know Winnie, Winnie is stopping right now. She loves the two rows. <laughs> so okay. she's great. And Carol and a few of us, we really love that thread showing the black thread looking like a pinwheel. It looks great. Yeah, I like it too. Um, a comparison with the other. Grace has bigger plans. She's going to wonder if um she can make a necklace. Oh, yeah. I've seen really beautiful designs where they join these. And there's a bunch of different methods to do that. Some of them are kind of advanced, but they involve brick stitching these together. You know, usually you'll add another bead in between the two. So it's really fun. It's addicting because you'll just keep going. <laughs> But yeah, so um, if everyone's feeling good about the join, I'll go ahead and start the next step. Definitely, Danielle. Oh, all right. So let's see here. From here, you'll want to pick up five beads. And the way it works as you're going around is each, each petal after this one is going to share the bead that's before it. So the first one, we're going to string five, and we're going to skip two thread bridges and go into the third, and then come up through that bead. Then from there on, you just need to add four. You skip one thread bridge and go through the next and come up. And I found that kind of worked. It kind of worked around without having to make as many guesses for which thread bridge to use. When we get to this part, I'll talk more about it, but you may have, you may have a different spacing here when you get there and it's all gonna be okay no matter what. There's different ways you can make that work. But, um, and that's, that's why you can do any bead with a stitch. You don't have to be using the same size as me. So here's my five. My five beads. Um, and again, same thing, size 10 check beads. I haven't switched sizes. Here's a close up of the thread bridges that I've got going on. I've got one, two, three. So I skipped two and I'm going under the third. And I'm going to get kind of a little wave there. You want to come up through just that last bead. That's the fifth bead we strung and pull tight. You'll get kind of a little rainbow shape. And pick four more. Oops, my thread's caught. <laughs> there we go. So here's four more beads. And it's four now because we're going to borrow this last one. And you'll want to skip one and two. I'm going to show you again what that looks like here. The one you're skipping, I wanted to note this because sometimes it looks like you're skipping too many, but this thread bridge will probably still be visible to you. So make sure that 
if you count it, you're doing one, two, and going to the next. But if it's not as visible, you're just skipping one and going to the next. But it kind of matters where you hooked into the last one. And it's not as, um, I mean, it's not super critical. It's still going to work even if you skip a different number. It's more of the consistency. So I'm looking at this one and I'm seeing the one that this bead is hooked into is this one. So I'm going to skip that one. And I'm going to skip the next one and then go through the one after that. But really, you're only skipping one thread bridge and going through the next. It's just that that one's so super visible there that it kind of looks like one. And there's our second petal. Let's get four more. And again, this is the one my current bead is hooked into, right? So we don't use that one. And we're going to skip the one after that and go into the next one. And so I just thought these looked like little petals. It was so cute. And I just kept going. The number of petals you get might be different. But the rule for how many to put on, it's actually the same as when you're deciding how many beads to go around. You'll just take a look at it when you get to the other side and you'll see, okay, that's too small for another petal. And if it's got too much of a gap, we'll add a bead. Or in some cases, you might be ready to just to go straight to the ear wire. And what I was finding was it didn't actually, um, it didn't stand out to me as differently or really, really noticeable whether or not that bead was there once the earring was finished. And I'll show you what I mean when we get there. But for now, I'm just adding four beads. Skipping, of course, skipping the one that my thread is currently hooked into you, skipping the next one after that, and going through the one after that. And then coming up through that fourth bead. So this part goes really fast and it's just kind of satisfying to build them that quickly considering how long the last parts took. And here we go, almost there. Okay, definitely have room for one more petal, right? Let's get one more on there. But I think this is my last petal. I'm hooked here, skip here, go here. And I could be wrong about that. Let me take another look. Okay. I'm going to bring these over and show you the difference. So one of them, I had enough space to sneak another petal in there. And on one of them, I added a bead in between. And how it looks when you add a bead in between is you'll just put another bead there. You just brick stitch one more bead, join it here, and then start your, your wire. But if you find that you have enough space for one more petal, you can make the bead that you um, join your petal to be that bead, so you'd only string three. Does that make sense? I know it's a little confusing, but it's one of those things where like, when you're looking at it, you'll, it'll totally make sense to you. So you remember how we shared the first bead here? It's possible to share that bead with your last petal if you want. I'm looking at this thinking, hmm, that's gonna be too big of a jump, right? Way too big. So I don't know that that's gonna work. So let's get four beads and see if we can fit one more petal. So here's the, the red bridge that I linked to you with the last petal. Here's the one I'm gonna skip and here's the next one. And so that one worked out for me with not enough space for another bead. So what I'm gonna do here is join to this one. So three scenarios here, you can join your last petal to the first. You can join the last bead you added to the bead that's there. Or if you have a really big gap that's not big enough for another petal, you can add one more bead, link it to the last petal, and then start your ear wire. All three ways are gonna work and they don't stand out as different when your stitch is done. And when your bead is all, you know, above it, it definitely is not noticeable how many seed beads are sitting there. But I used to get really hung up on that. And that's why I've, um, 
I've kind of talked a lot about it because I let that limit me in designs from trying stuff or finishing things. And that was kind of sad because the design is beautiful and no one but me sees that. No one but me knows there's two beads here versus three, right? Maybe there's three beads here. Maybe there's two. Maybe there's not, not even an extra one. Um, all of those things are okay. Just keep coming up through this bead here. And my tail thread is just kind of hanging out here for now. I'm not going to worry about it. We're going to just pull it up through the your wire um, thing at the end. So I've only got two beads here. So a couple of things I can do. I can brick stitch. So if, if you have a center point, go ahead and start doing this next step directly from your center point. If you joined your last petal to your first one, you'll be coming up out of that shared bead between those two petals. This still works for great for that. If you're like me and you're in this weird situation where you have two beads, you can brick stitch one more bead onto here. And then come up through it. But I don't want my thread to show on the side, so I'm going to show you how to sort of do that this way. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and start stringing. So there's one, two. When I come back down, I'm going to use the center thread bridge as a way to turn. So here's one, two. I need my crystal. One, two, crystal, and then one, two. Let's grab crystal here. I need some scissors. This is the color Siam. But you can use any color you want. It's a four millimeter bicone check glass. And that color is in the handout. You'll just need two for your earrings because you need one for each uh, one for each pair. So there's two seed beads, one bicone, two seed beads. For my ear wire, I'm using these gorgeous sterling. And it was actually the inspiration for the design was I just wanted to do something with sterling and turquoise. And when you use a really beautiful ear wire like this, having a gemstone, it's a really elevated design, I feel like. And so just go through the ear wire here and bring that down. Go back through all those beads. And to kind of tighten it, I held the ear wire and I pulled with the side. So remember when I came up from this bead, let me get the tail out of the way. I was exiting from that bead right there, which is not a center point, but I kind of want to center my thing. So I'm going to go, well, a couple of things you can do. You can go down through the other bead here. That's one way. And then come back up through this bead and do your ear wire. That will work great. You can also use the center thread bridge from here on out. And on your last trip down, come down through that other bead. And I think that's what I'm going to do. Because it's an easier turn. But both of those methods are going to work great. So under that thread bridge, that's the one that's in between my two center beads, up through the ear wire join again. And see how it kind of put that right in the center? And I think that looks good. So I'm going to stick with that. And it's pretty tight. I'm going to come down through these. And it's up to you if you want to make that trip one more time to reinforce it. I feel like if you're using wildfire, two trips, this is very light earring. Two trips is going to be fine. And the thread isn't going to come out because the um, open part of your ear wire is up here. And the thread's down here. So it's, it's pretty good. It's not going to come loose on you. Okay, so um, just to recap, I came up through this bead. I went through all these beads, came back down. I went under the thread bridge that joins the two here. Went back all the way up, came back all the way down. And now just to close things off and symmetry it all together, I'm going to come down through the bead that I didn't come up from in the, that first part of the, the journey there. And there we go. That's the whole thing. So all we have left to do is weave in. Um, if you're a knotter, you'll notice that my tail and my working thread have found themselves in the same place. And that might happen to you too if you end up with the same kind of join that I have. You can always weave to it and knot. I don't usually do that. Um, I've already got a knot sitting here on top of 
the the uh, the gemstone beads. All, all I'm really going to do is just weave in a couple times. So from here, um, what I think I'll do is grab this thread bridge, the one underneath that bead, and then I'm going to come up through that bead again and go down through through a few petals and then trim it. And then I'll bring the tail thread up and trim that. So there's that. And really, I'm just getting out of the way of all that thickness there. Back down through here. And I'm going to grab that thread bridge just by going in between those two beads, flip it around, back up through here. And if you want to do that once more, you can. You could trim there, it'd probably be fine. When I'm working on something I'm going to sell, I go and just do one extra. And only because I didn't I didn't do any knots. I just want this one to be really secure and out of the way. And I like to trim after I've done a brick turn. So down through that bead. And I'm going to go under. Hard to see, but remember, just go through the two beads, in between those two beads, and you'll 99% of the time you'll get the thread bridge. It's like I got it. And then back up through that bead. And now I'm going to trim that bead right here. Try to trim the thread from that bead. But after doing that little brick turn. So here's my scissors. And I'm going to push down, pull up. So there's one done. Tail thread needs a little help to go through the needle. So flatten that out. Okay, and this one, I'm gonna just bring it up through the bead. It's already been trimmed, I'm um, sorry. It's already been knotted. Remember we knotted it down here. I feel like it's okay to just go ahead and trim it. And there we go. And so all the decision-making there, it could be different for you, but there's three options for how to center your, your wire. And then also I wanted to share that this doesn't really, this design doesn't really have a center point anyway. So it actually really doesn't matter where your, where your, your wire kind of jumps out from. Here's an example of one where it's connected to a shared petal. That's the bead in between two shared petals. That's how that one looks. And this one, you know, we had two beads in between the petal. And here's one where we had even more, actually, no, this was another shared. I did have one where I had space for an additional bead, but that to me was kind of the difference between using the Nymo. The Nymo made more counts possible because it's just a little thinner. But yeah, that, that's pretty much it. Um, I was going to see how we're doing on time, and I do have another sample somewhere. I wonder, this one's pretty far back, but if anyone needs to see a join again, I could show that. And I'm seeing nice comments saying super pretty. Thank you so much. Yeah, I love this design. It it makes me happy. And it's so fun just to like, I get beads and I look at them. And the first thing I think about is, oh, can I stitch on that bead? Can I stitch on that bead? And that really starts to make, um, make your mind just see your stash in a different way. Because everything is something you can stitch on now, right? Like everything that you got in your box, components, beads, whatever. Danielle, because you have a few minutes, um, there's two things. One, I want you to show your spectacular year ending project. Oh yeah. Um, but the but the other question I promised to ask you today is for your your jewelry um, storage. Do you do you normally store your necklaces bracelets flat or do you file them? Like how how do you do most of your storage? I can show some examples really quick. I got a pile of them next to me. Um, sure. So I have those earrings, but. Um, let's see. So, um, I think with so many people have done so many of our classes, they have a stash now. I actually have, still have it in a bag from when I did my last show, which was a long time ago. <laughs> but um, so here's one example. Oh yeah, so I, that that's actually better. So literally, I used a fruit box. I mean, 
reuse what you got, right? I store things in plastic. The reason I do that is because I want things to stay untarnished. And if you put them in plastic, you're going to have a better time. Tuck your business card back there. And there you go. So a lot of my earrings are like that. You see, I was on a brick stitch kick. Brick stitch is like my favorite. Here's one where I did it on a bead. You can do so many beautiful things. Just like, and so here's an example of a bracelet. That's a, a bracelet card that you can make on your Cricut. This particular one, a friend of mine made, but we did a class where we sh we created a, um, a a bracelet Cricut print, and I can send you the link to that. I think we put it in the blog, so it's on the John Bead blog. Um, that's an example of earrings, one bracelet. Let me see if I can find a necklace. Well, so like sometimes you might have a set. So here's an example of a set where I've got the necklace just kind of in there. The main takeaway here is plastic, 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 plastic. It's got to be the thing that I do the most. I don't really have any necklaces in here except for that one. But depending on what the necklace is, you might want it suspended. You might not want it. They're, like they're all, you're filing them like, like a filing cabinet. They're not yes. flat. Mm -hmm. So like those are, these are little earrings and they're flat. These are my big earrings. And if I had necklaces, they'd be in here. I just glanced through, I didn't see any, but like my really big statement earrings are in here. Like, boom, <laughs> you know, there's this stuff like pretty long ones. Those beads are in necklace there. Danielle, yeah. that definitely answers my question. And now you have just enough time to show your upcoming class. I know, right? <laughs> But this plate, this room is full of full of stuff like this. It's just everywhere. I, I'm more organized though than I, I'm okay for organizing. It's not bad, right? It's okay. There's just a lot. <laughs> okay, next week. Let's do next week. Next week we have. Oh my goodness, what is next week? Next week's our crystal bracelet. Premium class. So that one is a premium two-hour workshop, and that one is a crystal stitch on a flat net. I used a three pack with the blues and um, I did get a lot of emails from folks who signed up that said they did not get the PDF. Please um, get me on Instagram, get me on Facebook or email me danielle.wix at johnb.com. Ask me for the, ask me for the print and I'll get it for you. Cause I think that um, you should have it in advance just so you, number one, so you can get the, um, well, the materials are listed, but you want to at least get a feel for like what you're doing. Um, so yeah, get me for that one. And then after that, we're doing holiday bangles. So that's the next one. So this class is a really easy beginner, fast stitch up, gift friendly, make gifts with any colors you want. It's six O seed beads. So it's going to go super, super fast. Um, I don't know, Pat, if you're here. Pat found an error in my PDF. Once they're once they're released, it's hard for me to fix it. It's not a big deal, but I wrote S8 throughout the document, but all of the designs are worked with S6. And then I wrote S8 throughout the entire thing. The legend is correct, but my instructions, I think I just really wanted to use the size 18 beads. So my brain just, <laughs> apologies. The instructions did stand as they are. They're just no, um, you know, um, no issue is like, there's no changes. The counts are the same. All that's gonna work just fine. Um, and then let's see, next one after that, coffee, cream, and crystal. I'm in love with these earrings. And we've had some students already make these. Um, and they're posted in our Facebook group. And they're beautiful. So I, I was really excited to see that. This one was really fun. It uses one of my favorite mixes, the coffee cream mix. And then the workshop for the end of December. And this is our last class of 2022, which I'm super excited with. I did this as an ornament, so it's got kind of a thing so I can hang it on my tree, but you can do these as earrings or a pendant if you want, but it's another brick stitch, like a brick stitch design class. So it's a flower, loads of crystal. The fringe is optional. Like you could just do the flower as your ornament. This would be a cool gift tag too, to put on your gifts. And um, you could also make more than one and stitch them together. So, and the course for this class, because it's a workshop, I'm working on other flowers that I'll share during that class. So you'll have more than just one flower to work with. But this was the poinsettia that kind of I felt inspired to do. And it's kind of epic. It took a while. But um, we're going to talk all about that in the workshop too. That's all I have here. I'm working on January already. Not crazy. But um, I'll share those next time probably. 
Thanks, Danielle. That was awesome. Sidebar is very, very happy with today. Oh, good. So I'm so glad. Thank you. I hope we can see some finished projects um, posted online would be great. Yeah, I love seeing them. Oh, yes, that's right. Tag us, uh, hashtag John B, hashtag make it with Michaels. And we'll love to see what you make. Have a great weekend um, and uh, happy beating and just lots of love to you guys. Hearts. <laughs> and we'll see you next time. <laughs> Bye. Hey, Danielle, before you go, I just want to let anyone know that if you have registered for the next premium class, please make sure you check your uh, confirmation for the pattern because I see some that are asking for a PDF. So please make sure if you are registered for her premium class to please check your confirmation for um, the PDF itself. Thank you all. Thanks, Felicia. Okay, bye guys. <laughs>